Today I'm going to talk to you about scaling NumPy applications from one CPU to thousands of GPUs. Um, this is actually only going to be a small part of my talk, but uh, I wanted to come up with something that would really grab everyone's attention, so that's why I titled my talk like this. Uh, I, I might be at the risk of over-promising and under-delivering, but we'll see. Uh, okay. So it's not working. Okay, uh, so, so before I start my talk, I sort of just want to say a little bit about who we are, because um, I'm sort of an outsider at this workshop. Um, I come from the computer science research group at Slack. Uh, it's headed by Professor Alex Aiken at Stanford, who gave a talk a few days ago. Our group's primary focus is on HPC, um, we're a pretty small group. There's only about three of us full-time, uh, two staff engineers and one staff scientist. Um, we, we mostly collaborate with domain scientists on applications of Legion, uh, which is a parallel programming framework. So everyone in the group is a computer scientist. We're not like physis, physicists or anything like that. Uh, the, the Legion project is about 10 years old. Um, it started, it was started by a PhD student at Stanford. And um, ever since then, there's sort of been this uh, funnel from uh, Stanford to NVIDIA of Alex's PhD students. So there is uh, some good backing by industry, uh, NVIDIA specifically. There's about, uh, I think, like at least five of Alex's former PhD students at NVIDIA who are all just continuing working on Legion. But um, Legion is also a collaboration between Slack and Los Alamos as well, not just NVIDIA. And we have users uh, at a bunch of different institutions and in industry like Amazon, Meta, uh, Facebook, uh, Sandia, National Lab, um, Carnegie Mellon, and so on. So some motivation for this talk. Uh, Everyone here loves Python. You're all scientists. You love using Python. It's easy to use. And uh, Python has just sort of become ubiquitous in all areas of science. So if you write uh, numerical heavy Python code, you can really improve the performance of your code by using NumPy. And together, uh, Python and NumPy have sort of lowered the barrier for entry for developing these complex scientific applications. But out of the box, your, your NumPy applications will still be limited to one CPU, the memory available within a single node, and they can't be accelerated uh, by GPUs. So you have solutions like Dask, uh, PySpark, QPy, plus MPI for Pi, but they're not easy to use, and they require you to modify your user code. So, so what if there was like a true drop-in replacement for NumPy that could fix these problems? Uh, enter QNumeric. So, so what is QNumeric? This is a real true drop-in replacement for NumPy. It's distributed, so it runs across multiple nodes, and is GPU accelerated. It's built on top of Legion and uh, Legate. And to the right here, we have an example of a, a conjugate gradient solver. So this was originally written using NumPy, and then making this one-line change where we import QNumeric instead of NumPy, we're able to scale this code from one CPU to 1,024 GPUs. Why is my, okay. So, so let's look at some more examples. Um, on the left, we have weak scaling performance for benchmarks, which, which use uh, this nearest neighbor communication pattern. So things like stencils, logistic regression. Uh, they, there's this uh, online course in CFD that is taught using Python and NumPy. So uh, someone at NVIDIA took, took the code from that course and they ported it to QNumeric with uh, very little changes. And they're able to scale all these applications from one GPU up to 1,024 GPUs on a, a DGX box at NVIDIA. Then on the right, we have uh, some benchmarks for applications which use a logarithmic complexity, like a Jacobi solver and conjugate gradient. So, so these numbers look pretty good for weak scaling. 
Uh, the, the next example that we have is this uh, torch SWA example. So this is a solver for shallow water equations. Uh, again, someone at NVIDIA just sort of went on GitHub and they, they found this example online and they decided to take it and port it to QNumeric. So it was originally written using uh, QPy and MPI and they just removed the MPI part and they were able to scale this code again from one GPU to 1,024 GPUs. So, so what is the current status of QNumeric? Um, it's still very much a work in progress. Uh, the, the project is not really that old. Uh, the, the beta was released by NVIDIA in March at GTC 23. Um, it currently offers 60% API coverage of NumPy, and that is sort of why I was not able to present some examples that would have been more interesting to this community. I tried to do what NVIDIA did, and I went online and found some uh, DFT code, and I tried to run it with QNumeric, but uh, it just wasn't ready yet. So, so, so right now, um, QNumeric sort of falls back to single core NumPy operations when something isn't implemented in a distributed or GPU accelerated manner, but you will still be able to run your application. It just may not be able to scale or perform. Uh, it, it supports Jupyter Notebooks, but right now you're limited to a single node. So this is something that I have brought up with NVIDIA and is on their roadmap for fixing. Uh, they're currently working with NERSC to get uh, QNumeric deployed on Perlmutter, so you'll just be able to go to Perlmutter and do like module load QNumeric and instantly have access to it instead of having to sort of build it yourself. But um, I, I have built QNumeric myself on Perlmutter and I was able to run it. Um, it's not super easy to do, so I would definitely wait until it's deployed. Uh, so, so what's coming down the pipeline? for the rest of the year. Um, NVIDIA is currently working on adding support for the li linear algebra module in NumPy and FFTs. Uh, distributed IO is sort of something that I have asked them to bump up their, their priority list um, because it's something I personally need. And I know the people who work on QNumeric, so I could just say, hey, do this for me. Um, they're working on higher order operators and performance improvements. So I'm currently investigating uh, use cases of QNumeric at LCLS2. I've been sort of talking to Beamline scientists and trying to get them to start using it. Um, that typically involves them giving me their analysis script and saying, you go use QNumeric and see if it works. And then if it does, we'll try it. Um, that's sort of how these processes typically work. So um, everything that we've talked about till now has sort of been about dense arrays, right? So, so what about uh, sparse arrays? Well, there's another library called Legate Sparse, which implements the SciPy Sparse API. It currently sits at about 35% coverage for four different uh, sparse matrix formats. And what they do have implemented so far is actually competitive with Petsy. Uh, so, so we have a sparse matrix vector multiply here on the left, and uh, the, the weak scaling looks pretty good. And then here's another uh, conjugate gradient solver example. So, so what if this still isn't enough? Like what if you wanna do something that doesn't really fit in this sort of like NumPy model? Well, um, QNumeric and Legate are built on top of Legion. So, so what is Legion? Legion is a task-based data-centric programming model. So, so what this means is that Legion supports multiple languages. So here's sort of a picture of the, the Legion stack. At the very bottom, we have Realm, which is sort of this machine model API that handles things like um, allocating resources, just like GPUs and CPUs and uh, memory and doing uh, data transfer, like interfacing with different network libraries like GasNet and UCX. So some users of Legion actually write directly to Realm using the C++ API. And then on top of Realm, we have Legion, which provides uh, sort of this task-based model. 
And we have, again, a lot of users who write directly to Legion using C++. But then on top of Legion, uh, we have Legate, which is sort of a library for developing uh, libraries like QNumeric. And uh, people are working on other things like distributed and accelerated pandas and SciPy. Uh, those are still ongoing at NVIDIA. And then we have uh, bindings for, for Python for Legion, which we call Pigeon. And finally, we have this sort of uh, custom programming language and compiler called Regent, which I will talk about at the end. So, so under the hood, uh, QNumeric and Legate are implemented as a series of Legion tasks. But what, what does this actually mean? So tasks are sort of the, the unit of parallelism in Legion. And um, Alex sort of talked about this a couple days ago. But what, what you really want to do is write sequential code and let the system parallelize it for you. So, so let's sort of build this task graph. Uh, here we have one function that outputs uh, some, some value and is consumed by these two other functions. And then those sort of output values that are consumed by another. So, so you've written this sort of sequential program, and you, you let the system parallelize it. And uh, when, when you do this, you, you have no way of getting synchronization wrong, because everything is sequential. And the runtime is sort of handling parallelization for you. So, so you've done this now, and you want to sort of distribute it across nodes. Well, the runtime can also do that for you, and it can handle moving data between nodes when there are dependencies in this task graph. It will determine how to do that automatically. And uh, based, based on the granularity of your task, it can actually overlap compute and communication. So, so network latencies can be hidden, which is something that whenever I talk to people who, who sort of use MPI, they're just really surprised by this. And then finally, you can let the system accelerate your tasks for you. If you have um, GPU variants of your tasks, sort of like how uh, QNumeric is implemented, it can decide, OK, it sort of makes sense to run these tasks on the GPU because of how much compute they're doing. But uh, more than that, when you have sort of these like mis mixed uh, tasks, like you have a GPU version here and a CPU version of this task here, you need to think about how do we get the data from system memory to frame buffer memory. Well, the runtime can do that because it can reason about this task graph and where your tasks are executing. So, so let's sort of start making some of these concepts like more concrete. Um, We'll, we'll describe the Legion programming model using uh, Python and the bindings for Python, which are called Pigeon. But these concepts also apply to C++ and Regents. So uh, if you prefer using one of those other languages, uh, you, sh you should be able to do that after learning these concepts at a high level. So, so on the left here, we, we have a simple hello world example. Um, you can see that your, your tasks are actually just regular Python functions. Uh, the bodies of these tasks will execute sequentially. And tasks can call other tasks. And your ex execution just begins like a normal uh, Python program at main. So tasks can also execute in parallel if there are no data dependencies between them. So in order to be able to do all those things that we just sort of showed on the, the previous like four slides as far as like moving tasks around and executing them in parallel and things like that. Uh, the, the runtime needs to be able to, to reason about your data. We said that Legion is a data-centric programming model, right? So, so your data has to be stored in these things called regions. And regions are just like multi-dimensional arrays. Uh, you have a set of indices. Uh, which we call index spaces. So here is a 4 by 4 index space. And then you have a set of fields, uh, which sort of describe like what data you want to associate with, with each index in your array. So here we have um, three uh, just float 64s uh, to represent an image uh, RGB values. So 
so I said regions are like multi-dimensional arrays, but um, they're also not like multi-dimensional arrays. And one way uh, they aren't is by the runtime being able to move them between machines for you automatically. Um, the runtime can also move them from CPU to GPU memory. And you can have zero or more copies stored of these regions in physical memory. And they can have different layouts. So uh, here is a few different layouts. Um, you can do things like C order or Fortran order for your, your indices. And uh, you can do like struct of arrays or array of structs, uh, whatever makes sense for your application. So, so all of this can change dynamically at runtime uh, based on what you're doing. So, so tasks need to be able to uh, operate on regions, right? And uh, regions are passed to tasks by reference. And then tasks sort of say what they're going to do to these regions. They, they specify privileges to access data. So your, your privileges include, include uh, normal things like reading and writing and then uh, reduction operations. So um, privileges can also specify uh, which fields of a region they're going to be touching. So for example, this F task, uh, it just says that it's going to read and we didn't specify a field. So that means uh, the runtime is going to assume that it's going to touch all the RGB fields, all, all three. But then this G task has specified that it will read from the R field and uh, read and write to G and then do some reduction. So, so you have sort of the building blocks now to, to start writing an application, right? So, so let's go write like a simple time step loop in Pigeon. Uh, we, we do some physics, update some ghost cell and uh, sort of do that over and over again. So, so here is how you would represent a grid, right? Um, actually, no, this is wrong. Don't, don't do this. This is bad. Uh, it's, it's just not idiomatic uh, code. So, so, so what, is, what is actually idiomatic uh, pigeon code? Well, one, one of the differences between uh, pigeon and other sort of task-based systems is how do you represent this large grid that won't actually fit on a single node? Um, other systems like Dask, for example, you would create like a region for, for each uh, piece that is going to live on a node. And you have these sort of ghost nodes. But in Legion or Pigeon, you just create one region and that's it. After you've created that one region, you partition it. So, so what does partitioning actually mean? Uh, it divides your region into subregions, and conceptually, you can sort of think of this as coloring the region. So here are some just different partitions of a region. Uh, we just have like some equal partitioning or some like sort of striped partitioning in different dimensions and. Here are just some like ghost cells. So subregions are actually views of your data. They're not copies. And uh, you can sort of think of this as if there's only one copy of the region in memory. So let's, let's go back and look at our time step example again. So now we've sort of partitioned this grid into uh, two pieces here and then along with these uh, sort of parallel pieces that will execute together, we have these uh, ghost cells as well. And we, we launch uh, one task per, per color in this partition. And now the, the update ghost task no longer has a separate ghost region requirement because it can just uh, operate on this cell. Directly, yes. So, quick question. So, it's it's not like you create an instance and then redo an object. You don't copy an object. It's just, I mean, it's, you, I mean, I'm looking at the boxes like, well, I would put an object, you know, I say this is an object and I would put it in there. But that's not the case. It's, that's not the case. It's just, can you just talk more about the difference between the beam and a, 
as opposed to a copy of an object? Uh, yeah, so, so the, the way the runtime actually works is you have these sort of two uh, different ways of representing regions. You have this sort of like uh, logical region, which is used by the runtime to, to sort of go through and reason about like, how do we build this task graph and then uh, do analysis to execute it in parallel. But then behind each of these logical regions, you have uh, things called physical instances. And what actually happens is on each of your nodes, you will go through and assign like this logical region to a single node. And then that node will create a physical instance, which will back this logical region in memory. And then uh, the task is able to sort of operate on that physical instance. And uh, in this case, you, you might actually have like two physical instances here like that. The, the runtime gives you hooks to do that. So like one instance might represent this piece and then the other instance might represent this piece. And uh, one, one reason why you might create two instances in this case is for performance, just being able to like operate on this piece independently of this. Um, I, I hope that sort of answers. Okay, so um, that, is, that is sort of one way of representing uh, these, these grids. And now your ghost can be update, updated automatically by the runtime because it can sort of reason about like what you are touching and how, how these pieces are represented in memory. So um, we have to update the privileges for the tasks that we showed. So now the, the physics task will read and write on the x field for this grid and uh, read from the y field of the ghost. And the ghost task will read from the x field and write to the y. So in order to get parallelism from your tasks, um, there's sort of two ways that you can restrict uh, the runtime from being able to extract parallelism from your task graph. And uh, one way is called uh, index space interference. So if you are just sort of trying to operate on the same uh, set of indices between different tasks and they are uh, using the same fields, then uh, the runtime will not be able to parallelize those tasks for you because you're just touching the same data. So it's, it's important to use different fields uh, when you're writing tasks if you're trying to extract parallelism. So um, we will just continue with this example a little bit and actually step through a full time step loop. So um, here is sort of what's happening. Um, we have the physics task and it's reading from the, the green uh, partition or the green subregion, uh, the X and Y fields and the, the Y field from the ghost. And then in parallel to that on maybe a different node or something, we have uh, a second copy of this task executing, but it's operating on this other half of the region. And then they output uh, to the X field. And then you're updating your ghost. And again, we have these two tasks executing in parallel. And then you sort of continue back to the top of the loop and just keep going. So um, how, how do we actually build these partitions, right? Uh, that's sort of the, the key piece to be able to extract parallelism. So we provide different partitioning operators. I think Alex uh, sort of talked about this a few days ago, but I will just go through it again. Uh, here is one for just doing equal partitioning. You just want to split your entire region into two pieces. Uh, here's another example called partition by field, where you have some field in your region that will be filled by maybe some library like Metis or something. And then you can say, OK, partition every uh, index in the index space associated with this region by this field. And then we have a bunch of uh, what we call dependent partitioning operators. So let, let's say we sort of start with this mesh and 
we want to find um, the the ghost regions for the ghost cells for these two uh, subregions. Well, the the first thing we can do is we can use the pre-image operator, which will sort of uh, follow these pointers from an existing partition S uh, along this this um, cell field, and then we can take the image of this partition uh, by following another set of pointers, and you will end up with these sort of um, two two colors here, and then we can subtract uh, these two partitions from each other, and we end up with these uh, ghost. Uh, subregions. So, okay, now you are all experts in the, the core fundamentals of Legion, and you go off and you write some application. Does your application scale? Uh, here's an example of a stencil that someone wrote um, using Pigeon. And we do some comparison with Regent. Uh, this will be a little bit important later on. Uh, so, so the original version of Pigeon uh, sort of scaled to a point, and then uh, once we sort of saw this, we went back and we implemented some optimizations, and this is actually the latest version of Pigeon um, with this optimization called control replication. So these are weak scaling numbers from PizDaint. Um, this, was, this was work done a little while ago, a couple of years ago. So, so the main task was ported to Pigeon, but then all your compute tasks or leaf tasks are still in Regent. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little more later on. Here is another example of a circuit simulation done on an unstructured graph. Um, the, the weak scaling, again, looks pretty good. And here is a more complicated example. Um, of an app application called Pennant. It's a Lagrangian hydrodynamic simulation on a 2D unstructured mesh. So all these Python applications have been able to scale on GPUs from uh, one, one GPU up to 512. Uh, there's, there's only one GPU per node on Pizdain, so. So, so the past three examples that we just looked at, um, they, they were weak scaled using GPUs, right, with Python which is something that is kind of difficult to do. How did they do this? Um, well, we talked about the different languages that, that Legion supports, right? And one of them was Regent, which is a compiler that is built on top of Lua and another language called Terra. It offers first-class support for the Legion programming model. And one of the things that Regent gives you over these other languages is code generation for AMD and NVIDIA GPUs. And soon you will get Intel support as well. And this is actually a one-line change that you have to make to your tasks as you're implementing them in Regent if you sort of follow some, some easy-to-follow rules. Um, domain scientists actually really like this because they don't have to do anything anymore to get GPU versions of their code. They just add this, what we call task annotation to their, their Regent code and out pops out this GPU version for free. So, so Regent tasks can be called from Pigeon. There is some interop there. And sort of regardless of which language you're using for your applications, the underlying Legion runtime is the same. And what that means is Pigeon and Regent applications have similar scaling properties as we just saw in those previous three examples. There are some optimizations that Regent implements that are not currently implemented in Pigeon, which is why there is like slight differences. But um, so some of those optimizations, they just can't be implemented in Pigeon because we don't have full access to the, the language, which is why we sort of went off and wrote our own compiler and programming language. So, so let's look at an example of a Regent application. Uh, this is actually the, ex the, the application that I work on. I've spent about like five years now working on this. Um, I trained domain scientists 
uh, in how to write Regent code. The original version of S3D was written in Fortran and MPI back in the 80s. And since then, uh, S3D has been port ported to Legion multiple times. There was like a C++ version, and then the C++ version was rewritten. And that C++ version was very complicated. Um, someone, a computer scientist, went and he sort of like hand wrote all this CUDA code and he went crazy and wrote AVX versions, SSE versions, uh, all these just vectorized versions of these kernels. And he gave it to these domain scientists and they're like, we can't do anything with this because we aren't C++ programmers. So I took S3D and I ported it to Regent and I gave it back to them and they said, wow, we can actually take this code now and do things with it. And after we sort of got to this Regent version of S3D, we started scaling it on the big supercomputers. So this is the, the latest work um, of scaling S3D on Frontier. We have gone from uh, eight, eight GPUs uh, down here up to uh, around 8,000 GPUs, so uh, 1,000 nodes. And the performance looks pretty good. So, so some more work that has been going on uh, with S3D since this is all uh, task-based GPU simulation. Uh, the, the simulation is really filling up the GPUs, right? But on Frontier, you have all these CPUs that are just sort of sitting idle. And we started thinking, well, what can we do with these extra resources that we're not actually using? Uh, one of the things that people sort of like to do is visualization. And we, uh, we've we been collaborating with this group at UC Davis who sort of specializes in writing these high quality uh, renderers. And they went off and implemented this renderer um, and wrapped it in Legion uh, using the C++ API. And then I sort of took it and hooked it, hooked it up to S3D and here is a profile of S3D running with this in situ visualization library. So, so you can see here that the simulation tasks are all executing on the GPU. And this is actually a 10 time steps of S3D, this, this big chunk here. And then on, on the CPU, we have these visualization tasks which are actually crossing the time step boundary. So, so this is the, the rendering task, which will render this individual uh, subregion. And then on other nodes, you have this rendering task also executing, and you have to composite them and put them together. So, so the compositing is where you start crossing the time step boundary. And um, all, all the communication for this is being overlapped with the, the compute going on with the simula simulation tasks, as well as um, the compute for the, the visualization tasks is being overlapped with simulation tasks once you've done communication to get these images onto a single node that you can composite. So we're, we're able to start using these extra resources that you typically wouldn't be able to use easily. So how, how does this actually work? So tasks in Legion can uh, register different variants. You can say, I have a, a CPU variant and a GPU variant of this task. And then at runtime, you can go and decide which version of the task do I want to execute. We have this thing called the Mapper API, which allows users to select those kinds of things. So um, like which, which processor do I execute a task on, either a CPU or GPU? Do I want to make copy of the data um, which is sort of the instance concept that we talked about before. And then which memories do I want these instances to live in based on where tasks are executing? So maybe like system memory, frame buffer memory, zero copy. Uh, what, what layout do these instances need to have if you're sort of interoperating with these like third party libraries that expect um, your, your memory to be laid out in a certain way? And um, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of other performance knobs that you can sort of turn. And this, this mapper API is really one of the, the key features that allows for portability between different machines. Um, 
I think Alex sort of talked about this a lot more in his talk, so I will not go into more detail about that. So uh, in, in summary, um, Legion is this task-based, data-centric, parallel programming model. And the Legion ecosystem is really starting to grow. And we're, we're starting to provide different ways to write these scalable, portable HPC applications. Uh, at, at a very high level, you have QNumeric, where you don't really need to learn anything at all about Legion. You can just go learn NumPy and write your application in NumPy, and then decide, OK, I want to start scaling this to a supercomputer, then QNumeric can help you do that. Maybe that is not enough, though, and you just sort of want to do something a little more that is, doesn't quite fit into this NumPy model, then you have Pigeon available where you can still continue to write your code in Python, but now you sort of have to learn these uh, Legion concepts. And then finally, if you want to uh, sort of get GPU acceleration with Pigeon, then one easy way you can do that is by learning Regent, or you can just go and write your entire application in Regent, which is actually what I prefer to do just because of how easy the language is to use and some of the features that it has, which you won't have available in Pigeon. And then a lot of people just go write C++. That's what they like to do. Um, that's what they're comfortable with. And you can always do that if that's what you feel like doing. So that is the end of my talk.